everybody. My name is Cameron Dennis, president and founder of the Blockchain Acceleration Foundation. We're a 501c3 nonprofit that is aims to accelerate blockchain development, uh, education, and adoption. We start accredited blockchain courses at universities. We build projects internally, and we do a lot of recruiting. Uh, we've placed about 15 people at jobs in the last like six to eight months at Venomask, Solo, a bunch of cool places. And um, yeah, we're here to. Uh, I'm here with Luke Kim and Luke and uh, Dr. Goldstein or Seth. Would you mind turning on your mic and camera to uh, come up on stage? And speakers. Lovely. Yep, I'm here with Luke Kim and Dr. Seth Goldstein. Um, Luke, if you don't mind introducing yourself and uh, asking Seth to introduce himself and take it away. Sure, sounds good. Well, thanks for organizing all this. It's great. Um, so my name is Luke. Um, I co-founded the Berkeley Blockchain Accelerator, and I've been the head of marketing at a few uh, notable crypto projects. So that's my background. Um, if you're in the Berkeley area, I also co-founded Startup Grind Berkeley. So feel free to plug in. Uh, but now I'm based in Miami. And um, my role here is to moderate the session and to really help tell the story of Seth and of what he's working on right now. Uh, so with that said, um, Seth, I'll pass it to you. OK, thanks. Uh, so I'm a professor uh, in the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon, and um, I uh, started uh, my sort of the you know the post facto uh, startup story uh, is I have a post facto uh, uh, research story, and that is that I've been most mostly focused on. Um, systems made of massive collections of uh, interacting agents. So parallel computers, distributed systems, building computers out of molecules, programmable matter. And when I came back from my last startup, I was looking for a new research area and I started focusing on the massively distributed system of uh, humans or the economy. Um, and looking at how uh, technological progress impacts the labor market. Um, in particular, I was interested in, to look at developing tools that would allow people to lead meaningful lives independent of whether they had what is, you know, what we consider to be a traditional uh, job. And um, that research was very academic, uh, you know, monetary theory, trying to understand reputation-based currencies. Um, and with the advent of the pandemic, I felt like, you know, this, this future of good, is, you know, where people aren't working and they're getting to pursue their dreams uh, had become a situation where people were without jobs and needed some kind of financial inclusion tool where they could get access to capital and create local currencies based on reputation that would allow them to continue leading, uh, um, leading their lives. And um, the other thing is that a lot of students lost their internships. So all of a sudden I had this pool of really smart students um, and we started accelerating this research project into a uh, something we could deploy. Um, when we started the research project, we called it Building on Local Trust or Bolt. Um, turns out there is a payment company called Bolt.com. So the transition from research to uh, an actual deployment in the real world has made a change from Bolt to Zeus. Uh, a Zeus was an ancient uh, currency. So that, that's, that's what got me here. Cool, yeah. Um it seems like blockchain um, is somewhat of a new concept, but it's the buildup of um, a histor historical length of time's worth of research and development in the field of decentralized decision making, decentralized computing, um, and economic incentive systems. Um, from our previous conversations, I feel like, Seth, uh, you're a fighter for financial access, equity, and inclusion. Um, and you don't see necessarily disruptive innovation as something to leave a certain portion of society harmed or behind. Um, you can disruptively uh, make changes for the better. And so uh, kind of from that angle, I'm wondering um, uh, what do you think of what do you think of uh, Zeus and how it could work within the context of both public and private sectors? Uh, what could that look like to an everyday human being? Okay, so uh, Zeus is um, 
uh, is, uh, like I said, a tool for financial inclusion. And the way to think about it is uh, it's a two-sided platform where uh, right now, anyway, we're thinking about businesses selling their zoos. So let's say Alice's Bakery, Alice wants to raise some money and Alice is going to sell Alice's Bakery zoos. You can think about these zoos as uh, digital gift cards. Okay, so this is a digital gift card that you could use at Alice's Bakery. So nothing special at this point. Although I, I do think that even if that was it, this is a much uh, less expensive way to sort of crowdfund, right? So you can issue these digital instruments that are parameterized in all kinds of ways uh, and raise money from your loyal following, from your community, uh, your customers, the people who know you. Uh, so your Alice's Bakery Zoos are in your wallet. Now, uh, you can spend them at Alice's Bakery, but you could also use them at anyone who's on the zoo's network. So Alice has an obligation to accept her Alice's Bakery Zoos, but Bob's Hardware Store could also take Alice's Bakery Zoos. And the reason why uh, Bob's Hardware Store would do that is that they're part of the community of Alice's customers, for instance. They go into Alice's Bakery every morning and buy donuts, or they just want to support uh, Alice and her her bakery. Uh, the beauty of this being built on the a public ledger is that all of the two way, sort of one-to-one -one transactions that occur between Alice and her customer, or between one of her customers and Bob's Hardware Store are stored on the ledger. And so we get two things from that. One is it sort of creates like a digital small town where your individual trusted interactions get exported to the whole community. So now, uh, you know, David's hair salon can see that there's multiple stores taking Alice's Bakery Zoos and they do business with those stores. So they'll also accept Alice's Bakery Zoos, uh, essentially creating an emergent bottom up local currency. Uh, the other advantage is that um, over the long term, this data, like the, the, the sort of shape of Alice's Bakery Zoo's fundraise and um, who's using it where, uh, can be sort of turn the, the soft capital of reputation into some quantitative me me uh, metric. And that's important because this system will allow people to raise money, small amounts of money from their communities. But when they really want to access larger amounts of monies, uh, money, uh, they can go to uh, sort of Main Street banking, you know, traditional uh, funding sources. And now they have a quantitative metric that can talk about their reputation. And this is, I think, crucial because community banks have been closing at a really rapid rate uh, in America. I mean, I think last year alone, over 3,300 community banks closed. Um, and the community banks uh, had sort of knew their community and used reputation to make loans. It wasn't just a straight numbers games, but the larger banks, you know, it cost them the same amount of money to make a $50,000 loan as to make a $50 million loan. And they just don't have the metrics or the, the understanding to make those loans, so they're leaving a tremendous amount of money on the table and hurting small business growth at the same time. So the idea, so the idea of some unified currency across borders or cultures, um, the idea of some digitized currency, like in-game tokens, um, the idea of you know common point systems between Chamber of Commerce districts, uh, these kinds of things are not new, but what's new is that we can implement um, using cryptocurrency, using blockchain technology. And so uh, my question would be, um, in terms of Zeus itself, um, we kind of see a picture of how it functions, uh, but more mechanistically, would it be considered an NFT, a non-fungible token? Uh, would that be what people are issued? Uh, would they be issued um, some number of tokens out of a finite supply, um, or um, would there be some other kind of mechanic by which you handle the central banking, essentially, uh, of Zeus? Um, yeah, how would this all work? And, I guess, would you even interact on-ramp, off-ramp between different different currencies or um, fiat currencies as well, not only crypto? Yeah, so um, 
I think, uh, so I'd love to come back to the historical precedents in a minute, but to answer your question, the way we're envisioning this now is, you know, the digital gift card, I think is the right metaphor for most people to think about this. You know, that people have an experience with using gift cards. Uh, it's a digital gift card that you can spend at multiple places as opposed to just where it's issued. Um, and every, uh, every member of the network can issue as many as they want. So there's not a finite supply of tokens and the value of each one of these zoos is essentially pegged to whatever the local currency is in the country that they're operating in. So Alice issues 20 Alice bakery zoos, that's $20 of Alice's bakery zoos. And then they can be divided up however, uh, however you want. And she can continue to mint more zoos and sell them to other people. So the, the, you know, unlike a traditional fiat currency, there is something backing them, the goods and services of Alice's bakery, um, but uh, there's not a central bank, um, there's uh, not a limited number of tokens, and it's really up to Alice's bakery to do the fiscal management to issue the zoos. Now, there are ways to build into the protocol that there's like, a particular zoos that Alice is issuing will only have some limited number. Like she wants to raise $10,000, so she issues 10,000 of them. And then she can make an escrow transaction. So people could say, okay, if you can get $10,000 worth in this period of time, then we want it and otherwise we don't. So in that case, there has to be a way for people to commit their uh, zoos or fiat currency to this contract until she's reached 10,000. Uh, so this is where the on-ramp off-ramp comes in. Um, so how do we get US dollars onto the, the chain? Well, that's going to require some interaction with, um, with, other, uh, with other ledgers. Yeah, it seems like in an ideal world, what we would see is this token economy uh, whereby the locality's uh, tokens, uh, they have enough reputation and trust within the network so that people want to you know, give out tokens and uh, take them for payments for services and products. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe uh, this locality will even benefit because um, the digital gift cards, the token economy they're in, um, it beats out uh, the exchange rates, it beats out um, the US currency, the national currency even, um, I guess, if you look at it from an unoptimistic angle, um, you might think about how uh, this uh, would effectively turn the everyman into an issuer of their own currency. Um, you know, people with no experience managing monetary systems, uh, inflation rates going crazy, um, and the minting of additional assets ever more, uh, kind of turning each person's uh, Zeus token uh, into something that is less and less valuable, even in utility terms. Um, so I guess from a both utopian and dystopian standpoint, um, how do you see this kind of public sector or community currency working? Um, yeah. So that's a really good question. And the long-term impact is at this point still unknown to me. Um, I, I think this, there, there are a lot of paths to making this something that is really beneficial to a lot of people that would not be able to have access to capital. And one path would be actually a partnership between the government and the people in the sense that, uh, you know, I think a universal basic income would be a great thing. It's probably politically unpalatable, unpalatable though, to say, okay, we're going to give uh, $10,000 to every U.S. citizen every year, uh, just from a budget point of view. But imagine if instead the government said, we're going to guarantee... 10,000 zoos of every citizen every year. So now the citizens can mint their zoos and if they're only doing 10,000, then those are hard guaranteed by the US government. If people know that it's guaranteed by the government, then they're not likely to actually turn it into US dollars. Right? It's just the way the FDIC is on the hook for trillions of dollars, but uh, they uh, only have to spend a few billion every year to keep the banking system from uh, collapsing. People don't make runs when bad things happen at banks. 
So this would be like a politically palatable way to actually give people the liquidity of $10,000 every year. Um, and in the process, the hope would be that people also learn how to be fiscally responsible. So they're not gonna print a billion of their own zoos and everyone's gonna say, whoa, I'm not gonna take that. Everyone can see exactly how many are on the ledger. So there's no incentive to devalue your own currency in some sense. Um, so I, uh, I think that as we grow uh, from having a few pilots and doing things where there's some merchants raising money and uh, those merchant zoos are being used locally amongst many businesses, we'll learn what things work and don't, like when a business tries to print too many zoos or offers a no, like doesn't offer any interest, even though they're in a risky situation or they hide information from the public. So we'll sort of figure this out, I think. This is, think of this as a substrate on which to build an ecosystem where people can actually turn their reputation into capital. Yeah, understood. Um, so there's a question here, actually. Um, it says, basically, uh, this is assuming that people trust in the US government long-term, right? <laughs> question. Um, True. Yeah, you got to admit, the, the idea of decentralization, um, yes, does point to grassroots movements, but also um, it points to power being away from authorities that we traditionally look to. And so if we involve the public sector outright uh, in community coins uh, of anything else, just community coins, well, isn't that antithetical <laughs> to what blockchain is trying to do? So, you know, I don't see blockchain as a philosophy as much as a technology. It is a technology that can be agnostic of policy. Regulation has a place. I think there's some areas where regulation is important and essential. Um, and, and there's also a place for creativity and tearing down, you know, the the structures that limit access to things and not having regulation. Um, so I see the public, a, a public ledger, and you'll notice I try not to use the word blockchain because it has connotations that don't make sense. So for instance, for zoos, uh, we want people to use it to buy a cup of coffee. So trans, you know, transaction fees have to be sub cent. Time to finality should be in the seconds at worst, right? So, so anyway, so with public ledgers, uh, I think there is a possibility to uh, turn the transparency into a very powerful tool uh, for people to gain access to uh, systems that they wouldn't have had access to before. Um, and uh, I don't think it has to be antithetical. I think they're good examples of community currencies issued by the government. So for instance, in Tonino, Washington, in the, uh, Great Depression, they they printed uh, Tonino dollars. I don't think they were actually dollars, but whatever it was, some Tonino currency, you, a, a script uh, on wooden uh, on pieces of wood. So it's called a wooden currency, and it only worked, you know, was useful in Tonino, and it really made a big difference to that community. And when COVID started, uh, they re revisited this, and they didn't print them on wood. But they, the, the, the city government printed their own currency and gave it to citizens in need, and it really made a difference. And so um, while I don't see the U.S. government knocking on my door saying, yes, we want to do a UBI tomorrow, I do see uh, that as a possible use case. I mean, one advantage of having a system that's built around uh, a a protocol is that you can imagine doing a lot of different things. So I talked about a very simple example where one, each merchant is raising their own capital independently and their uh, you know, supply chain and social network are used to uh, turn this into uh, a emergent community currency. But you can also uh, imagine another system where a group of merchants get together and they say, let's all issue the same currency. We'll call it the East Liberty currency. Uh, and that's a, a neighborhood in Pittsburgh. And we'll all work together to put limits on how much we each can mint 
and what the interest rate's gonna be and put a little money aside in a reserve pool in case one of the businesses fails to make sure that all the people that hold the currency are going to uh, be made whole. Or you could imagine a foundation that wants to give a grant to a community. Right now they would give it to the individual businesses, but instead they put it aside as a guarantee of the individual merchant zoos. And now instead of having $100,000 that maybe it goes to $10,000 to 10 merchants, uh, if they do some reasonable estimation about what the failure rate is, maybe that $100,000 is enough to capitalize a million dollars worth of uh, liquidity for the merchants. So there's, uh, I think, a lot of potential upside if we're creative about how to use the protocol. Uh, I mean, uh, the audience should definitely check out uh, Ithaca Hours um, and other examples of public sector and public sector linked currencies that have been out there. Um, at a more local level. Um, it seems like, yeah, we can trust generally in our local communities, but sometimes the fear of government might come from the federal side. Um, and yes, a lot of potential and necessity, honestly, to work with policy people in order to execute big projects. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm with you on, uh, on thinking that maybe blockchain should be treated first as a technology and then as a philosophy. Um, at the same time, I mean, uh, it's one of those things that's exciting because uh, blockchain is intimately linked with the idea of decentralization. Um, and with the idea of communities um, owning and controlling what their fate is. Um, but anyhow, um, I did want to ask you, um, so there's a bunch of questions uh, that have come up during your talk. Um, and so uh, a question with an upvote here, uh, what role does liquidity have in the zoos network? And who are your expected market makers? What, what role does what have? Uh, what role does liquidity have in the zoos network? And who are your expected market makers? Um, so I'm assuming this is a question that's related to if I'm hold, I, so maybe someone could clarify it, but the liquidity of an individual merchant's zoos, is that the question? Um, so the, each merchant is responsible for redeeming their own zoos. Now, if I go into a, a merchant and they say, well, I don't accept Seth zoos, you know, I only accept Luke zoos and I don't have any, then I would like there to be some liquidity for me to essentially exchange my, um, sorry, the sun is uh, coming in at a strange angle here. Uh, the, uh, I would like to um, be able to exchange my Seth Zeus for Luke Zeus so that I can do that transaction right on the spot. Yeah, it and seems like, um... I mean, would it be correct to say that at a very hyper local level, um, you're trying to find a way for people to transact across a common network without having to buy into a government program uh, necessarily. And this, this uh, economy would be powered uh, by an underpinning of value based on services and products available in the municipality or in the locality. Um, and people will be able to do cross chain transactions or transact in the same chain, who knows, uh, but basically transacting um, in a barter system uh, that is represented digitally um, as a diversity of tokens that kind of ride the same rails, um, if you will. Right. So I, I can I can imagine that there is some sort of uh, highly liquid bridge currency, like let's say a U.S. dollar stable coin Zeus, that people can trade to and then trade back, because there's probably not going to be enough. Uh, a liquidity between you know the n squared pairs of zoos right so you can imagine there is a bridge currency in there and we actually have a protocol for creating that um, it's also also important in that sense because uh, there needs to be some way to incentivize the consensus builders who are creating the ledger and they aren't likely to take some arbitrary zoos as a fee for a transaction so there probably needs to be some uh, some sort of bridge currency that both works to incentivize for incentivizing uh, the people keeping the ledger and also for doing some kind of trades. Um, so digging more into token economics um, and zooming out from just a tech angle, um, as a matter of outcome, uh, how much money would a small business, um, just a business in a city, uh, expect to be able to raise uh, through the zoos ecosystem 
um, whether this is linked to the intermediary um, liquidity token or whether it's um, linked to one of the individual Zeus tokens minted by the businesses? Uh, so um, I don't actually know the answer to that. We, in fact, got a commitment to do um, a pilot just uh, two weeks ago. So there's a neighborhood in Pittsburgh where we're going to be piloting zoos. And I think, you know, we'll find out when we're on the ground. But my expectations are that, uh, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of dollars should be something that should be uh very doable. So, you know, across over the pandemic, uh, there was a lot of GoFundMe campaigns. Mm -hmm. A recent study showed that it actually exacerbated inequality. Uh, over, I think it was 60% of the campaigns got zero dollars. And the successful campaigns were generally in more privileged neighborhoods where people had uh, had money to give. And so those campaigns raised tens of thousands of dollars. Most people got, you know, a couple hundred. The okay. advantage, what? Oh, no, I was, I was just saying, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it was really not not what I was expecting. But, mm -hmm. but the fact is that in those kind of campaigns, people are, first of all, donating their money. They don't expect to get anything back. So you have to have extra money to do that. Um, but so this would be a purely donation economy, uh, or yeah, so that makes it a little harder. But or, with or Zoos, would allow you to take investment at all, uh, not for equity. With okay. Zoos, though, you can buy somebody's Zoos, giving them hard currency, and use them somewhere else. So you're not locking your money up. Right, right. I mean, you have liquidity as far as you can redeem your Zoos. So it's like yeah. getting gift points. Uh, gift points, like like gift card points. Yeah. Well, or just a gift card of dollars, right? Right. Yeah. Okay, well, I see. So for small businesses, um, insofar as community is concerned, um, you'd rely on a degree of goodwill for people to want to donate money. Um, well, and not donate. Not, 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 yeah, not voluntarily give away, but more so get back. Uh, instead yeah. of financial purchasing power, uh, the power of this Zeus crypto economy um, with which they can enjoy themselves, you know, get ice cream or pay for sports tickets or do whatever they want in that municipality. Yeah, or, I mean, a business could say, look, I know that people might want to get their money back. They're doing this purely as an investment. You know, I'm paying 10%. Uh, so, uh, or even if my, my, the people initially buying it are planning to use goods and services, if they use it somewhere else, that merchant might, might want to get cash. So you can check a box that says it's redeemable for US dollars. Right, right. And I mean, if there's a, token, an intermediary token to do a fiat off ramp then, um, you know, that adds even, um, I mean, to the amount of liquidity you can kind of command within this network. Um, so, okay, um, another question from the audience. Uh, it goes, are you concerned about potential privacy issues arising with fully public payments? A really good question. So uh, I have a particular philosophy about privacy that's probably not that popular. Uh, I think transparency is a huge positive thing. Um, so uh, I'm concerned that people might feel like it's a problem. Um, but I think that uh, they're having the transactions on the ledger in a public way is a good thing. Um, now, if you want to do some kind of transaction and not have your identity be exposed, then you can do that on the network by creating an identity that's not linked to anything in the real world. So on the ledger, it's just an ID. The question is, is, is that ID mapped to the real world? Well, if I'm Alice's Bakery and I'm selling zoos, people are going to want to know that it's Alice's Bakery zoos that they're buying. And so we have a protocol to take those identities and sort of prove that they're related to some real world artifacts like incorporation papers and your location in a particular town uh, or your driver's license or whatever it is that you want to do. But you don't have to do that. So if you want to be anonymous, you can create this identity and now the question is, is who's going to trust that identity? So we have this notion of a trust line where uh, one user can say, I trust the zoo's 
of another user, meaning I will also obligate myself to accept their zoos. So once multiple people have obligated themselves to, to back your zoos, even if they're completely anonymous, then they get the same reputational stake as the people who are trusting it. So I can imagine that as part of the system, there will be entities that are in the business when uh, that person not know that, that that bought that object, right? So you can use this trust lines for a lot of things, but one of them you could do is to provide anonymity, but still have some of your reputation. And probably what you'll do is you'll pay for that service. And so I think that's reasonable that privacy should cost in some sense. Okay, understood. So by participating in the ecosystem, you're consenting to a level of visibility by other people around your activities, um, probably mundane activities, honestly, but activities nonetheless. Um, and there should be a price uh, that people are willing to pay in order to preserve their privacy, um, at least more so than the degree um, which, you know, one could argue is fair to provide to all users from baseline. Right. Okay, gotcha. Um, well, yeah, it looks like Zeus um, is something that can stand on its own feet, potentially. Um, it's something that with public sector support uh, could reach more scalable adoption uh, and reach, you know, great successes with pilots. Um, it seems like uh, it's not necessarily a decentralized system, um, but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it, it could be centralized if working with government parties um, for good reason too. Um, and people will be participating in an economy where they can see each other and actually signal trust, um, which is a little bit antithetical to signaling uh, trustlessness, uh, which is what blockchain you know, is kind of thought to do as a baseline. Um, but yeah, uh, all that said, I mean, um, in your opinion, what would be the best way for people um, probably listening in right now to onboard uh, to the idea of Zeus and to maybe you know help you prove the model, so to speak, um, whether they're crypto people or not? Uh, so they should go to zeuslab.com and there's an email address at the bottom of that. Send me email. Um, and they can also go, I guess I could put in the chat, I'll put in the chat when we're done, a link to the um, the research page, and we have a white paper there. And if they're interested, uh, there's a form they can click and and uh, you know to get involved. So uh, we, I would love to uh, talk with people about this and figure out what the right models of uh, for deployment are, and even more importantly, how to explain this to people who don't aren't steeped in in crypto. Um, so that would be uh, that would be ideal. Very cool. And um, I've heard whispers that maybe there is a potential fundraise coming down the line, um, or the de deployment of an original protocol to run Zeus across communities around the world. Um, do you want to speak at all about that? About potential plans for expansion or commercialization here? So uh, you know we're running a pilot. Uh, that's going to get started at the end of the summer. Um, we've been talking to uh, you know lots of different communities, uh, mostly in um, mostly in the United States, in Pittsburgh, uh, New York, and um, uh, but uh, we've also been talking with um, various parties, both governments and universities and and businesses. Uh, in France and Portugal and Mexico, in India, in Ghana, and in Rwanda. Um, so uh, we're exploring lots of different avenues. Um, at this point, we're really focused on getting this pilot off the ground and making sure that our use cases are are what we think they should be and developing the, the you know, material that can explain how this is used and, and help people to get started this way. Assuming that a great community energy builds up around Zeus and that Zeus is able to prove value as a use case in the public, um, in terms of different merchants in a locality who buy into Zeus, uh, how would value fluctuate between those merchants, Zeus? Um, and would there be uh, some original uh, price oracle or uh, would Zeus be leveraging something else, potentially like Chainlink? Um, so the, Hey, Luke, would you mind coming back on? 
So I'd like to ask you, while Seth is getting his stuff figured out, tell us a little bit <laughs> about your experience. <laughs> because, um, you know, the reason why uh, we got Luke to interview Seth is because Luke has a lot of experience in local currencies as well. And, um, you know, I'd love to learn a little bit more about some of the stuff you've done in Syracuse. And uh, I guess what sort of insights can you bring to, uh, you know, do these potential pilots or actually real pilots happening with, with Bolt or with Zeus, excuse me. Am I back oh, on? You're oh, back on. Hey, oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. I don't well, know when you lost me. I'm sorry about that. No, I'll tell you exactly where. Um, so we can pick right back up. But uh, first to address your question, Cameron. So um, everyone in the audience section right now and those listening after this recording goes live, um, I'm a friend of Cameron's and uh, kind of new to uh, the Acceleration Foundation here. Uh, but I believe in what you all do. And so this is really great to kind of be in the same presence. Um, I was the uh, co-inventor for something called Syracoin. And so Syracoin is the Syracuse coin. Uh, it was a digital currency that the mayor of Syracuse at the time um, and a company I worked at before uh, where we cooked up this model of uh, bonds, smart contract bonds uh, on crypto and uh, another model of um, running donations, uh, kind of similar to Zeus, honestly, um, on um, crypto. So that's kind of the background here. That's why my passion um, come, is very much for public sector currencies um, nowadays. Um, and pitch this stuff to a bunch of governments, including uh, the West African Monetary Zone, um, like Rhode Island, uh, just various random governments. Uh, but I've noticed that it's not a very sticky idea, public sector currency, because um, it seems competitive with existing fiat currencies. Uh, it seems subversive to the idea of uh, control. Um, we could say power, but I don't know. I think that's a little politicized, but control. Uh, administrations like to control things, and it requires control to you know, kind of protect processes and status quo. Um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, governments are resistant to cryptocurrency for a variety of reasons. Um, and from the crypto side, um, like to be honest, um, it's not as if we've proven any sort of lasting value, um, some superior value to using crypto to run municipal currencies or incentive programs of any kind um, outside of maybe gaming um, and like really cool NFTs you can buy and sell real fast. Um, but yeah, that all said, um, Seth, uh, we were kind of asking um, what about uh, in an ideal Zeus ecosystem, um, how would merchants uh, relate to each other in terms of the transactional value of their Zeus assets? Um, and also, would you be relying on some sort of price oracle? Um, would you have some way to determine prices and um, like cross-chain compatibility within Zeus? Um, yeah, how would all that work? So um, I actually want to, before I get to that, it's related, this idea of public sector currencies and the, and the, and, and, the public ledger, cryptocurrencies. So I think that one of the things about Zeus is it's it's a it's sort of an emergent community currency, and everybody's community is a little different, and that there's overlapping communities that we all have. So there's Alice's Zeus and Luke's Zeus and Seth's Zeus, and the question that each one of these are backed by someone separate, but will people start to take them anyway? And it's that emergent property that I think requires something like a public ledger in order to do it. So that that's the value I think that the cryptocurrency brings to this idea of a community currency. And community can be defined in a lot of ways. It could be a geographic area. It could be an issue. It could be, you know, all dairy farmers. Doesn't matter where they are. It could be, you know, just a small neighborhood in, in, uh, in Pittsburgh. Um, so, as far as the value of individual merchants, uh, zoos, uh, we have developed some, uh, extended some uh, sort of random matching monetary theory, uh, so we can build a um, essentially a ranked order of how valuable each individual zoos is to any person on the network, right? Because a particular zoos might be worth more to me because I go to that store all the time than Luke who lives in Miami because he's just not interested in the zoos issued by a Pittsburgh merchant, for example. And so that's how we're going to determine the sort of uh, which zoos is most valuable to you. Now, if they're all traded on some liquid market, then of course there'll be some equilibrium price that everyone applies. But at least in the beginning, we see this as being much more community focused. Gotcha. Yeah, I think how 
tokens are valued, um, it's kind of intuitive. In a community economy, you would have some consensus, hopefully, um, after a critical mass of usage, uh, whereby an Apple and another Apple would be com comparable in price. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, that's also idealistic. All of blockchain is idealistic. So, you know, uh, I think <laughs> your eyes are right with it where they need to be. Um, but I guess the dystopian uh, underside here is if, let's say, I'm a very hot shot uh, chef and I come into a new place and using Zeus, I generate a lot of goodwill, uh, get myself a lot of liquidity in exchange for my hopeful Zeus ramen tokens. Um, but as a chef, I don't have any intent to stay. So um, then I somehow liquidate my Zeus um, and kind of uh, hop town. Um, and maybe that not only leads to people feeling hurt, but uh, also to like neighboring restaurants hitting um, like reputation walls or hitting walls of youth of the trust. Um, so yeah, I'm just wondering, this seems really, really complicated. Uh, the, yeah. this, both the disincentivization of bad behavior as well as incentivization of good behavior, yeah. Yeah, so this is one of the reasons why I think, you know, anonymity isn't such a universal good. Uh, and that being transparent and on the ledger is important. Um, you know, hopefully that chef, when he goes to the next town, uh, won't be able to sell anybody his zoos because people will know what happened. Um, so uh, I think there's, uh, first of all, there is the, I think my probably most important answer, which is I don't know. <laughs> um, but the combination of um, trust lines and we also have a way to ensure zoos uh, will lead to ways for the consumers, people who are supporting businesses and buying zoos uh, to get some kind of protection at some cost. And so we're thinking about exactly how that is going to be integrated into the ecosystem. I, I think in this pilot, there's, you know, hopefully goodwill and established businesses uh, that where we won't run into that problem right away, but it does will need to be addressed. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe so. So a lot of things are probably not figured out concretely at this point. I think I've been a part of many blockchain projects, and they're always changing things to the last minute. Uh, but the core idea generally stays the same, and I think you have a lot of integrity in that core idea aspect, which, as before uh, we mentioned, are financial equity and access and inclusion. Um, but yeah, that said, um, in the in the potential future of Zeus, um, do you see yourself doing any sort of public token generation event? Um, and why would that be necessary if so? Uh, so that is a good question. How we're going to fund the long-term scaling of this project. Uh, I think that that is one possibility. Um, and, you know, once we see how the pilot works, we'll get closer to, to you know, really thinking about that uh, hard. Um, I think that there is, there is a lot of development to be done to make this really work in different cultural aspects and for different communities. Uh, and there's a lot of, like, we, we spend a lot of time talking to not-for-profits that are boots on the ground trying to make things better for marginalized communities. And there are ways that I think that we can help do that and also, uh, frankly speaking, make a ton of money. Uh, and, um, but we're gonna, need, uh, we're gonna need to be able to, you know, do the experiments, carry out the development, you know, all of that is gonna require funding as it does for any serious enterprise. Wait, okay. Okay, understood. So, well, um, this would be a case when, uh, from an academic environment and from some um, much discussed principles and theories and whatnot, uh, there would be a spin out in the commercial market. Um, which I guess uh, at the core is about helping people access capital um, in a way that's perhaps smoother and more self serving than it is to do it in currently available ways with traditional uh, financial methods. Um, and I mean, if you give people the power to sort of serve themselves, then you can guarantee yourself a level of grassroots support, um, you know, if the use case is true. That's what we hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's check if there's any more questions from the audience. Uh, 
Oh, and I know, um, Cameron, we need to get in soon to the, to the group setting, right? Um, yeah, but just let me know when that needs to happen. Um, oh, are you trying to call in right now? Oh, there you go. Yes, hey, how's it going? Um, so yeah, I think there's one question in the audience that did not get asked. Um, I'm trying to pull up the chat. Oh, here we go, it's small. Um, would there be a fluctuation of value between Alice's Bakery and Bob's hardware? I don't think, uh, would there be a fluctuation of value between Alice's Bakery and, and Bob's hardware? You know, I, I think that, that that is a possibility. It's not really where, given that each zoos is uh, marked to the fiat currency in which they're issued, they can pay different interest rates, which is going to make them have different values. But this isn't really, at least we're not envisioning it today as a trading platform. So those, in the at the end of the day, one Bob Zoos and one Alice Zoos are both going to be redeemed for one dollar. So, assuming the merchants don't fail, they have the same value. Yeah, I was I was personally a little, a little, I guess, like confused around the exchange component. Like, are you expecting there to be exchanges on top of this? Or are you also building the exchange interface? How would that how would that work? So, in the original protocol we designed, we did have a uh, you know a, a bid and offer uh, uh, mechanism so that people could exchange zoos. We're not implementing that in our MVP, um, but of course, there's nothing that says that there couldn't be a third party marketplace. Um, I think that in the long run, having some way to exchange zoos very quickly. Uh, will be useful. So if you walk into a store and you don't have any zoos that they want, you can quickly go through a you know a multi-step trade that gets you to zoos that they'll accept. Yeah, I'm thinking about like the potential automated market. I guess applications you can you can get kind of if if you actually if you get adoption with this thing at scale, um, I think that you can attract a good amount of liquidity mainly from the DeFi DGens out there. Um, if you can somehow provide like a an appealing yield to the liquidity, and if there is enough transactions and activity, I think that could be a a potential. You know, I think I think in the long run there clearly will be a marketplace. Um, so I, you know, I see this like I said as, as some substrate on which to build a huge, lots of different things that can be done. So for instance, you know, anybody can issue zoos, but wouldn't I pay? Uh, a little bit more um, to have my my business certified by some due diligence company that puts that certification on the um, on the ledger, and if it turns out they certified it improperly, they're at risk. Yeah. Right. So there's lots of things that you can do based on this basic idea um, that will add to the ecosystem in the long run. Yeah, I mean, you're building a, the infrastructure for an entire economy, like in, in short. Um, now, what about like you know your customer rules or anti money laundering? I can see there being some some concerns around that. No, oh, me too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, we have been talking to various people about this. There are. We don't have what I would say is the solution that I really love at this point. Um, if anyone has some suggestions, I'd love to hear it. Uh, so, you know, at this point, we actually don't touch money at all. Uh, if somebody wants to sell zoos, they actually get the currency and then tell the system to issue zoos to that person. Um, but, uh, um, those are things we definitely need to work on, and I'm open to uh, really would love to chat with people about solving those problems. Yeah, I've, it's actually a problem across the entire industry um, because regulation is coming for DeFi. It's only a matter of time, um, and I think so. The so the so the wind is blowing in the direction of uh, actually using. Uh, well, enabling, changing the definition of a virtual asset service provider, a VASP, to anybody who is issuing said assets, um, i.e. even developers or entities or protocols themselves. 
um, and having them go through, we'd be, be having somewhere on the platform take their money transmitters at this point. And granted, none of this is legal advice. They're, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the point is, they're money transmitters at this point, and they have to collect information to assure uh, know your customer and anti money laundering uh, prerequisites. And that is a concern when we're talking about a decentralized protocol like Uniswap. Um, and I see this becoming more of an issue. And I've actually been participating in a lot of uh, DID, decentralized identity working groups, specifically around this concept of, um, well, decentralized identity at large. But for the case of KYC, it's really having to do with uh, zero knowledge proofs is one potential solution that has not been proven to scale yet. Um, but if you're able to essentially just take a proof saying that this person was verified at this point, that they are who they say they are, and you never really need to provide the underlying personal information of the user to the verifying, to, to all the other parties, you just need to prove that they've been verified um, without providing any underlying information on them. And that is computationally expensive. Um, it's not that it's not feasible in a lot of chains, public chains right now. And so this is, I think, one of the biggest caveats for this issue of having a scalable KYC, uh, zero knowledge KYC in short. Um, yeah, so, so I think that that is the right approach, but we might need more because it's not just that they were verified. They're, you know, they were verified as a what? And is this the same person as somebody else? And can you prove that they're different people? because you get to limits and then you have AML that kicks in. So there's a lot of complexity here uh, in the long term. Um, some, uh, I hate to say it, some regulation in this area where there was a regulated identity provider would go a long way to actually making a lot of people's lives much easier. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's a very hard thing to solve. The closest entity that I'm seeing doing this is Gitcoin um, and the various ways that they're testing for civil, they're, they're trying to become as civil resistant as possible. And for those who don't know in the audience, that means you're not allowed to act like you're creating an account for someone that you're not, and you have to verify your identity somehow, um, saying that this account belongs to one person, and that person doesn't own a thousand accounts. Um, so that is Gitcoin's the entity that I'm seeing it done the best by, and it's they use uh, third-party applications like uh, Proof of Humanity, that ID. I was actually recently going through all these apps, and I recommend those interested in the audience do the same. Um, there is uh, a Bright ID, which is another one. Um, there's all these sort of attempts and and ways to start doing this, but it has not been done at scale. And Gitcoin seems to be the entity applying it um, at, the, at the most scale, at least. Um, so definitely check that out. I think that's that'd be helpful. Um, but if there's no more questions from the audience, we're going to move to the, um, the networking component of this. But first, um, thank you, Luke. And thank you, Seth. This has been really, really cool. Um, amazing to get both of your sort of sides on this. Um, it's very experimental stuff. I mean, we're talking about solving really large issues here um, around local currencies, bottom-up money, like these things have been talked about for, for hundreds of years. And um, it's really cool to see them taking shape in when we can actually verify ownership on a digital decentralized ledger. Um, so I'm excited to see where this goes. Uh, thank you both again for, for sticking on. And for those interested in hanging out, um, just turn on your mics and cameras. You'll be in this sort of networking space. Click two times to switch tables. Um, that's pretty much it. See you next week. Thanks, you guys. Really appreciate you coming. Thank back. you very much, Luke and Cameron. Thank you. Yeah. Any last words I should have asked? Is there anything else you guys want to drop? No, I appreciate sure. it. <laughs> Thanks, both of you. And if there is, this uh, Zeus ecosystem token generation event and team building, I'm sure we'll see it. And all the major publications soon. Yep. A oh, big time. Thanks, guys. See you in the networking. Thanks.